Hello. Yeah. Ah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, we don't mean to be having a private conversation in front of everybody. <laughs> Laura was supposed to be here, <laughs> and I have to substitute. <laughs> oh. But she could have done it over Skype, right? See? Yeah. Yeah. Great. No, we can't go without you, Larry. <laughs> I'll be one of your panel. <laughs> oh. Am I supposed to retreat? Oh, my. Well, there's a beer mug. It's from the Qingdao movie Metropolis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have an Oktoberfest as well. You know, Qingdao, oh, okay. has, yeah, Qingdao has an Oktoberfest every uh, August, I think. And then... Um, that's, I think that's why we were there, also October. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I think that they, the whole of Qingdao, basically, yeah, uh, has uh, different beer festivals around town. The only place... Why not? The, the only place that looks like Germany <laughs> in China, I think. Am I supposed to uh, bring in our panelists? Usually they come in and talk Sure. Oh, okay. Usually they're Hello. Hey. Would you like some water? Um, yeah. I got some right here. One more thing. Bless you. 
It's an interactive panel. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry for dragging you away from uh, the impeachment hearing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, <laughs> I guess we all had enough. <laughs> um, I, I am Gary Ko. Uh, I am subbing for Laura, who is on video t today. Uh, because uh, she is in China, working on her projects. So, Laura Chen, we'll start with Laura Chen as an uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, Laura, why don't you kind of give us a, a rundown and then we'll go down and each one of us will introduce ourselves. Okay, thanks, Gary. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Morning, Laura. It's about three o'clock. Three, three, oh, wow. three. <laughs> yeah, it's three thirty. Three o'clock <laughs> in the morning. She's very it's early. Okay, you can, you can but, see. I, but I'm awake. Um, most of you probably know me. I'm Laura Chen. I'm the president of I T Thai Inc. This is a film production and service company uh, based in the U S. and China. Currently, I'm producing and uh, directing a documentary web series here. Uh, the content is about the Chinese first generation filmmakers and who they are and uh, their current work. Um, it will be a five episodes web series, 25 minutes per episode. Um, it will be exhibited on ITE platform next year, 2020. Um, I'm also teaching in Beijing at the Beijing Film Academy. And recently, we as a group, the class 1982 of the Beijing Film Academy, all have been invited as an honorary professor by the Qingdao Movie Metropolis. I want to show you guys. I don't know if you guys can see this. Nice. For those of you who don't know, uh, that used to be the Wonder Studios, Movie Metropolis. Yeah, so we were there 20 days ago, and uh, they want us to help them bring more business, and they also offered, let us use the studios. So it, it was quite impressive. Okay, I'm done with my, thank you, Gary. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, next, uh, we have Yan. Yan Chui, the only person I haven't met, I think, in this panel. Uh, so please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Yan Chui. Uh, I was born in China and <laughs> um, came to the US by 2000 and uh, study film in Canada and here. Um, basically, I'm writer, director, producer. Um, I spent the last eight years in China, um, made four films, uh, directed to produce four. <laughs> um, I know quite a bit about um, what's really going on in China. Um, I mean, it's still, for me, it's still very um, new. Every day I have to learn how to, even though I'm Chinese, in, you know, um, but since I live in the West for too long, I have to learn how to adapt myself into the Chinese mentality and uh, especially film market and the film audience. And there's a huge difference between the, you know, the West and the Chinese. Anyway, so if you have a, any question, please ask me. Okay. Next, we'll have our because our uh, esteemed banker, <laughs> Bennett, who doesn't need an introduction. Thank you, Gary. I don't need an introduction. Thank you. 
So um, as brilliant as possible, I want to thank Laura uh, for continuing to put this on and, um, and for having the fortitude to stay up all night and with, with a terrific smile on your face. So that's, that's <laughs> always great. And um, I have the, the pleasure to know everybody here on the panel pretty well and, and I'm actually looking forward to their comments today. I'm a banker. I work for East West Bank. We specialize in entertainment and all different forms of media, um, technology, et cetera, um, both in the U.S. and also in mainland China where we have a local business there. And we lend money there for local programming as well as we do for stuff here. Um, so I hope I didn't say that too loud that Larry heard me because he, he might he might ask me to do something later. Okay. Uh, and next we will have uh, Jess, Jess Wiener. Again, I want to thank Laura, of course, for putting this on and having us here. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I, was serve, I served as partner for a large Chinese law firm for many years uh, called Yinka Law Firm. And now we've actually been opening up offices here in the U.S. So I'm a, a new firm called YK. I'm managing partner of that firm. I have offices in New York and L.A. And in China, uh, basically I've helped in the uh, entertainment industry, helping companies like Hunan TV and their slate financing deal um, with Lionsgate and also helped the Chinese company purchase the XXX franchise with Vin Diesel. And I just work on various uh, films uh, for China, generally they're based in the U.S., like Ning Hao's uh, Crazy Alien and The Rookies came out recently. And um, that's the kind of things I, I work on, although I guess we'll get into the conversation of how that's been changing over the years uh, as well. And uh, last but not least, uh, Larry Neymar, uh, a person that I have heard of for a long time and not have met until today. Uh, when I first went to China, uh, one of the um, uh, assistants came up to me and said, oh, do you look, know Larry Neymar? I said, no, I don't. Uh, then he said, oh, you know, I was working for him at Woodland Hills in Warren Center, and he was uh, bringing a bunch of show into China, and I'll let Larry introduce and tell you what he has. Sure. Uh, here in the U.S., probably better known as the founder of E! Entertainment Television, which I sold to Comcast a few years ago, uh, decided to go to China and start a, start a new life there. So I uh, started a media company there. We've got, uh, we do TV shows. Everything we do is in Mandarin. Uh, TV shows, we do film, uh, we do music, we do live events. Uh, we have a museum show that's now uh, moving from Shanghai to Chongqing. Uh, it's called the Da Vinci Experience, which is now in its third year in China. Um, and um, we, we just do a lot, a lot of stuff there. But again, we really looked at the market and said that, you know, you can't take what you do in America and just bring it to China and subtitle it and they'll be happy. We, we said that wouldn't work. So probably that's the main reason we've managed to survive there for as long as we have is that we just decided we will focus on the Chinese market in Chinese specifically for the Chinese audience. And so far, so good. Uh, just, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Gary Koh. Uh, spent um, 20 years at Disney. Uh, working in technology. Um, uh, in 1994, uh, Wanda called me and uh, recruited me to become their uh, chief technology officer. And uh, they asked me if you know I'm ready to build uh, the largest movie studio in the world, which is in Qingdao. You know, uh, and that was what we were kind of chatting about with Laura, the studio she just visited. Uh, it was a tremendous experience, uh, uh, once in a lifetime kind of experience. You never get to <laughs> build another studio in the world, probably in at least not in my lifetime. I think, yeah. Uh, it was it was a great experience, and I um, I, f I finished with Wanda around 2017, and uh, moved back to LA, and uh, basically have been kind of. Uh, involved in different other consulting projects so far. Thank you. Um, so I guess to start off with, uh, we can, we'll go down kind of every, uh, the, the panel and see uh, what everybody thinks. Um, 
The last couple of years, U.S. and China relationships has been very tumultuous, to say the least. Uh, we had, you know, the drop in investment from China from China from 46 billion to uh, 2018 to 5 billion, an 88 percent drop. Uh, there was the tax scandal, which kind of like blew up. Uh, if some of you have heard it, uh, Fan Bingbing and is one of the most famous person that got uh, detained, I guess. Uh, there was this, this, of course, you know, our famous trade war, you know, that our president have launched uh, between us and China. There was the Huawei incident where they started, um, you know, um, when when uh, the CFO of uh, Huawei was arrested in Canada and detained, and a lot of people were worried about, you know. Wow, I thought we just had a fire. <laughs> you never know. This is fire season, I guess. Yeah. So people were very concerned about, you know, uh, going to China, working in China, uh, because of the whole tit for tat kind of uh, um, uh, games that the the governments play. Um, a friend of mine who has been in the real estate business in Beijing have been posting a lot of vacant uh, expat dwellings in Beijing. So it get, tells me that people are also exiting it out. So I, I just want uh, our panel to kind of give their perspective in their own, their own area and, and, um, and see what, what has, how has it affected them, how has it um, um, involved them? Uh, are there crises? Are there uh, problems it has created? Are there good sides of it? So anyway, we'll start from Larry going down. Sure. Um, well, you know, the, the main thing that's kind of affected us has been the trade war. Uh, it, it used to be, um, you know, in our relationships with most of the Chinese companies we deal with, you know, everybody would say, well, you know, we may not agree with, you know, your presidents, but at least we knew they were coming from a point of sanity. Uh, they said, now with this guy, we have no way of predicting what he's going to do in the morning. Um, and, you know, he could wake up and tweet something about President Xi's wife and she'll ban everything American for the next 10 years. So really what that has done is put a tremendous amount of risk into the equation. So jointly, we've decided that all new projects should just be put on pause and just wait till this thing plays. It's bigger than us, so it's going to play out however it plays out. Um, so the things that we've had going before continue to go, and they continue to do fine. Um, but all the new projects of, that required, that were so closely tied to China, either by financing or in China, for China, uh, we've put on hold. So, you know, From the legal perspective, from, from, you know, being a lawyer and working in China and now in the U.S. as well. I can say, of course, uh, in, in the old days, you know, five, six years ago, a lot of deals happening, right? China investing a lot in the U.S. And now, you know, of course, I read in the trades these days where you hear about, you know, China's changed and you're not doing those kind of silly, um, you know, or unfavorable site financing deals and other things. I say, are they talking about me? You know, like my deals? And I guess it's true in those days where those kind of deals happened and now they don't. And I will say it's true from my perspective, deals like you know, those slave financing deals or other larger investment kind of deals in the U.S. not really happening. Um, from, from the law firm perspective, though, what, you all, what we do see more of from China, frankly, is litigation. I guess maybe in previous years where China and the U.S. wanted to keep a very good relationship, people would hold off and not really litigate. But now, at least my law firm is seeing a lot more well, deals that maybe didn't, went sour or when China has an issue that they want to follow up on, you know, there is litigation taking place. And same for the China, for U.S. and China. Litigation has its own problems with, you know, enforcement and so forth. I'm just saying that that area, at least, is something that has now taken off now that deals aren't closing as much or not as much is happening there. Um, I guess that's kind of mainly from, from my perspective, on, on, the law, on the law front, at least. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> um, I use, I'm, I'm kind of a simple person. I break things down. Um, 
you know, into compartments. And so I think there's like really two distinct issues. One's trade war and one is internal, you know, in speaking about entertainment industry. And so for the trade war, um, which is also temporary, and temporary meaning it's either going to end, you know, um, next November or it ends four years from next November. And I think the key there is getting, um, because administrations always change, and I think it's finding an administration that can, um, I think, take a higher ground, longer term view, and more collaborative view in working with China. I think that's key. And I think that we've seen, you know, from pretty much all the other administrations going back from, you know, Nixon to Obama, and we saw a lot of, you know, positive development between U.S. and China. And look at all the great things that these two countries have been able to do together. It's really phenomenal. Um, so I think right now there's just kind of the cast of villains from either side. We've got to get past that, make that go away, and again, temper it will. <clears throat> Meanwhile, inside China, there are serious issues with the entertainment industry in terms of cost structure, revenue structure. And when you look at the revenue models for, let's say, a film in China, it's pretty limited. You, it's like, I don't know what the percentage is. Maybe it's 1% of movies make a heck of a lot of money. Um, if it's something like um, Wandering Earth or Nija or um, Dying to Survive or that bullying movie that's name I forget that's out, you know, yeah. like this week or last week. Um, but a lot of movies, you know, kind of suffer and there's not a lot of other... Um, windows of opportunity that you can really monetize as there might be, let's say, in the U.S., you know, or in, in, in the West without theatrical, you're still okay. You have plenty of other avenues of which to monetize. Um, Larry and, and I think Gary brought up some issues, you know, in terms of um, what was happening from the tax side. And I think a lot of that was more behavioral um, in terms of you know, how actors, talent, CEOs of, of Chinese entertainment companies, how they should be acting in public. And I think that's one of the issues. The second is capital. And there's been a capital flight, you know, out of entertainment. Um, and the kind of the tax thing that Gary talked about, basically all the film companies had to pay a tax or pay back taxes because uh, there's different interpretation of tax law over the last couple of years. And so there's a lack of liquidity. And so then you have certain TV shows or movies were then made, fully financed, couldn't release. Um, that hurts companies because you, you know, you've, you've spent maybe somewhere between three and 700 million RMB. You can't get it back for a while and maybe not be able to get it back in, in terms of the size or relationship to what you spent. And then how do you then go and spend for the next shows? And so this is something that I also think that we're towards the end of that cycle. I think there's a lot more um, um, clarity. You know, I think one of the other issues there, there was a change in <clears throat> the board that approves what can be released. Um, it went from one side of the government to another, and that created a lot of confusion. So I think that as we head into 2020, I think that we'll see um, some health return into the local Chinese entertainment community. And last, um, I guess, data point for that is following the stock market in China, which over the last about 18 months has been down about 5% um, over the last 18 months. But the entertainment industry, if you look at their stocks, they've been down about 35% in that same period of time. There are some companies whose stocks are down 70% in that period of time. So not everybody's going to survive. There was a lot of debt um, as well that um, you know, getting that debt paid back could be a little bit tough. So these are some of the changes that are happening in, into the landscape there. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I will say... But I'm so, optimistic. Okay, I'm sorry. Know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> or at least the thing is almost over. <laughs> um, I would talk from the production side. Um, for Chinese film, I, I think more and more the, the audience are more mature, more sophisticated. Now in China, good film is a 
it's getting great attention, especially like now there's a, a small film called、um, 年轻的你 no, 少年的少年的你 It's like a youth, so, so something, a love story、um, by a, a Hong Kong young director. It did a phenomenal、uh, box office, and the, what I was very、um, surprised because the the film is actually edgy, which is、uh, amazing how the 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 thing changed. It's not like a flowery, you know, kind of a always a nicer. It's about Violence in school, so that's never been addressed in China. It's it's amazing. I don't know how they get the censorship, but I heard it's supposed to be released in the summer, but it was postponed until after the October the celebration of the National Day. So it did so well. It's still going up. I mean, unbelievable. So I really feel there there is a hope. You know, the audience love. Good movies. I guess it doesn't matter. It's a American Chinese corporal or Chinese local film. As long as you touch, you know, audience heart, it's still, you know, there's a hope for a good、uh, movie. In terms of production, I talk to many of my friends, you know, producers. It, it seems like everybody's waiting. To, I don't know what they're waiting for. They're just like. Um, we don't know which direction we're gonna go, except、uh, everybody's looking for mainstream、uh, projects. Mainstream means、um, any project about Chinese、uh, history, bigger event, which you can enrich the history,、uh, uh, spread out the word about you know what happened in China in a in a very positive way. So that's what I heard. Everybody was looking for those projects. I mean, I、um, I don't mind it, you know, to make a not commercial movie. For example,、um, during nineteen、uh, fifty, right after the Chinese uh, uh, the the communists took over China, there is a there's a. a <coughs> Army、um, uh, number eighteen army went into Tibet at the time, and they brought ten thousand art、uh, scientists artists into Tibet. I guess nobody really know about it. The reason I know because my dad was one of them.、Mm. <laughs> well, he's a geologist, and he. When I was young, I didn't understand why you you all, you know, march into Tibet for what? You know, I I never get it. So now it's sort of like, what I bring this up because this is sort of what I mean the important historical、uh, event. So so film about those are getting proof, are getting attention. So everybody producer are looking for event like that. That's what I felt, but of course, on the commercial side, comedy always work,、uh, romance always work,、uh, thriller, yes or no, <laughs> depend on, yeah, not too much dark side of it, you know, of the society, but more positive、uh, attitude in terms we should, of. We, should, we don't need another. Wolf Warrior Three, right? <laughs> well,、uh, I heard that actually. <laughs> It's already in the rules. Yeah, right? that was. The, I think they were trying to do it, but it was kind of stopped. I don't、uh-huh. understand, you know, why they stopped that. I kind of say that that genre about feeling good, like almost like propagandish, pro-government kind of films. I, I kind of thought was more moving, more of those in the run-up to the 70th anniversary. I think it's anything like a new、yes. kind of new, new genre, even. It's like、uh, what's it called, like main melody. Kind of film, right? Right. Ju, right. Zhu Xuanlu, Zhu Xuanlu. Zhu Xuanlu. Zhu Xuanlu film. Yeah. yeah. So even like an interesting, like kind of a new genre even come up, because、right. these special kind of films that have become become very popular in China just recently. But、yeah. yes, and next year they said there's another big celebration. That's right. The, it's the hundredth year. Yeah. The yeah. The, the Communist Party. So it's probably even more. <laughs> 
anyway, so that's okay. my... Uh, so, Laura. Yeah? <laughs> what's your, what's what's your take? <laughs> You've forgotten the question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I was looking in the box office, the film, yeah, she just mentioned. The box office, at this moment, they update every five minutes. <laughs> and uh, it's now from CBO China box office is 1.4 billion with a B, mean B, which is about, translated about two billion U.S. dollars. A yes. small film, so that's how big the market can get. Um, yeah, to get back with the panel about the question Larry just asked. Yeah, I'm saying uh, the film sector, the production has uh, slowed down a bit, but it was kind of a quite too much. For example, last year, 2018, uh, I believe the number of a feature film produced uh, somewhere around 900. Only, I think less than 300 get into a cinema. So which present an issue because where the investor stays. If you invest a film, film didn't get into a cinema, likely you would not recoup your investment. So this slow down a little bit is not a bad thing. When um, an industry is on its growth curve, it always have ups, downs, it's normal. Uh, I see that. To me, my personal involved professional project has been okay. Um, luckily, we got little finance on our project. So maybe my advantage is growing up in China, although I spent uh, some 30 years in the U.S., work professionally, but still in China, in the film circle, people consider me as one of us here. So, um, yeah, that's the last thing. Thank you. I think, you know, one of the things I kind of uh, observed through all this bad news and all that, uh, I also noticed that, you know, China this year had uh, a new genre, um, Wandering Earth, a sci-fi, which was huge. I think it's the third largest movie in China ever now. Yeah. And this is a, a, a genre that has never worked in China. And so, so it tells me that the audience is definitely maturing. It's starting to change. It's starting to look for more diverse products. Uh, and you also have Niza, Niza uh, the, the animation. It's also, and it's like the second largest uh, movie in China right now. So it tells me also the animation market is coming as well. So, you know, in those ways, it's kind of positive. I mean, um, from the personal side, you see uh, Laura in China uh, making her documentary, and uh, uh, another uh, panel that had to cancel, uh, Matthew Knowles. Uh, he's in China, uh, I, I believe, working. So, so there, there are silver linings to all this as well. I believe that, uh, you know, Going back to uh, what Jan said, that everybody's waiting, <laughs> you know, and, and we as human beings always want to make sure that, you know, things are all lined up. But the truth is, there's no perfect moment to wait for. It's just, just go ahead and do it, you know. Of course, you need people like Bennett to help you finance it, but, you know, I think that uh, I, I see that we probably have gone through the worst, hopefully. <laughs> and, and, and I'll see it start, starting to boom again and hopefully not to be as crazy as, you know, the 2016 gold rush kind of thing where everything was crazy and Wanda was buying the world, you know. But I think that the, 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 the entertainment industry is starting to take root and uh, mature in China. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, the panels uh, was that when I was at... Um, Wanda, one of, the thi one of the things that we tried to uh, develop was to make Wanda Studio, now Sunak, a, uh, a kind of a, a way for 
uh, international companies to come in and do co-production because, as you all know, uh, China has a 34 quota limit and the only other ways of getting your movies in there is either through uh, the flat deals and, or uh, you know, a co-production. So we wanted to make sure that you know, all this complexity were kind of abstracted from the, the foreign um, uh, producers and from whether it is dealing with visas, dealing with payroll, dealing, you know, basically you just come in, you know, cut the deal and hopefully we can smooth everything out for you. But of course we never got to that point, sorry. Uh, uh, it was just uh, the, the whole Wanda uh, imploding and uh, uh, the, the, the business of, uh, the entertainment business kind of like uh, gotten uh, kind of like for, you know, 2018. So I wanted to see if, um, uh, what, what do you, what do the panels think about co-production and uh, have they ever been involved in it? Uh, is it simple, hard, and why isn't there more co-production, I guess? Sure. Uh, okay, first, um, I'll comment on the Wanda Studio. <laughs> Sorry, Gary, but I, I got to say it. it. You know, they did all this good stuff. They built an amazing studio. It was as good as any studio I've ever seen in my life. They forgot one thing. For any studio, you need workers. There should have been a training program that you couldn't get below the line workers to go out to the studio. You had to bring them in from Beijing. So all the savings you were having by producing in Qingdao, you lost by having to import workers from all other places. Um, that was one of the main problems for everything we looked at in trying to bring co-production in there. Um, and we suggested ten times training programs to train a generation of not just, you know, film students from USC that go back there, but people who know how to do the lighting and pull the cables and do all of that stuff. Um, uh, you know, the other thing with, with Chinese cinema is they're probably a generation away from having a lot of good, and I'm generalizing, having writers who know how to write great stories. Um, even Wandering Earth, which did amazing. Um, if you looked at it, I mean, I thought the movie was horrible, quite honestly. I thought the effects were interesting. But at the end of the day, you have a movie where everybody on Earth dies, and as a viewer, you couldn't care less. And I'm going, shouldn't they develop some of the characters that I loved or, you know, whatever, that I felt something for? So, you know, but when you have a system where, you know, the government can tell the, all, all the factories, all your workers got to go see a film, y you can have an effect, a dramatic effect on the box office and make something look like it was this brilliant film. And in fact, it, uh, you know, like I say, Wandering Earth, I didn't think it was very good. But, you know, if you tell all every worker in China, you get a free ticket to go to the movies, you could manipulate those numbers. Um, <clears throat> we're still confident. Uh, we, we've stayed in China, and despite all the problems, actually for guys like me who choose to be indie, um, the problems are good because it keeps the big guys away. So, um, you know, like I always say, if, it was, if China was easy, Rupert Murdoch would still be there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it'll come back when it's right. It's, it's a cyclical thing. All the stuff with the... the um, the censorship and stuff, a lot of it just simply has to do with the fact that this is new to them. They've never had to do this kind of stuff before, and they're learning how to regulate as they go along. And it gets better every day. I mean, I've been in China for almost nine years now. I've gotten censored once. Um, that's because I tried to do a TV show about pet animals and stuff, and there was a, a, some obscure law about promoting vanity animals and, you know, they wanted everybody to spend their money to feed their pig or educate their kid, not put a diamond sweater on their dog. Um, <laughs> other than that, you know, it's been fine. But they, like I say, we've had the same thing here. I hate to say that I can actually go back far enough to remember when we used to have standards and practices. I mean, there was a time in the United States that Lucy and Ricky from The Lucy Show couldn't be shown in the same bed together even though they were married. Um, it, it, it changes all well, the time. That might be more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's all I have to say. Jesse? 
so many things in that statement. We have a whole yeah, like, just, panel just on, on that. But um, obviously, on the co-productions, um, you know, this goes to more, to more to producers, I guess, than the lawyer. But I would say this also kind of leads us to the question of um, are we talking about China's market internationally or then like U.S. China co-productions, right? Because if this, if this for all the points that Gary mentioned before, for those, all those reasons, including Trump and our trade war and so forth, uh, maybe other things too, U.S. China co-production is really generally not really happening. And again, I think our producers can talk, or you know, filmmakers, more to that in their personal experience. But even I hear from producers and they try to get a U.S. China co-production passed. It, it just is not right now, unfortunately. However, we are seeing other countries and China uh, having you know, a much more fruitful relationship now, uh, which also, even if we hope that this trade war gets better soon for the U.S., you know, I, want, I kind of wonder what will happen you know, years from now. These relationships that are happening now with China and other countries, they're becoming much, much stronger, especially other you know, Euro European countries. So even if things get better in the U.S., China may, may have just found, well, wait a minute, we have great films and great producers in Europe and other, in other countries, and maybe we don't even need U.S. as much as we thought we did. And I think we're hearing that from heads of Chinese companies as well, and their different comments and so forth. So that's just kind of my take on the, um, the co-production aspect. Thank you, Jesse. Sure. <laughs> um, wow, there's a lot to, I think, to say here. I'll do it as quickly as, as, as I can. Um, I've never been a big co-production fan, for the sake of co-productions, because most co-productions in that U.S.-China vein were usually more about making money, um, tapping into markets, than they were about the art itself. Um, when, um, um, you know, playing off of Gary's earlier comment about recent successes of movies, notwithstanding Larry's astute observations, I'm always wondering if it's less about the audience and more about what the filmmakers are doing in China um, in terms of expanding, if it's expanding in a commercial way or expanding in an artistic way that I think is doing well. I think Chinese audiences, especially in the first two tier cities, are so sophisticated and so nuanced um, that when movies in China, you know, really break out in a large way, if it's a wolf warrior or if it's, you know, wandering earth, it's because they're finding audiences in the fourth tier and the fifth tier cities. Um, I actually liked Wandering Earth, but I'm not a filmmaker, and I'm sure Larry's correct in his observations, but, like, you can find other disasters-themed movies in the U.S. that you might hate more. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a genre kind of thing, right? Um, I look at, um, I know you mentioned Wolf Warrior earlier, and those movies to me are important. And in fact, I kind of start with Taking of Tiger Mountain as really kind of the birth of this modern day patriotic action movie. From that film to Wolf Warrior 2, which re really resonated in a way very kind of Rambo-esque, Sylvester Stallone-esque kind of quality to it, to um, Operation Red Sea or Operation Mekong. So we're seeing some, I think, great you know, trends that follow. Um, in terms of you know, the comedies, you know, I've always worked well in China, but it's very local, doesn't really travel. And then you get to, I think, some interestingly themed movies, and I forget the name of the bullying movie that, that you, you referenced, yeah. it's been number one the last few weeks, that also ties into like a dying to survive, and it also ties into some really heartfelt Indian movies that have crossed over and worked really well in the China space. Um, for animation, in addition to Nija, there's been a lot of you know, Japanese animated movies that have done exceedingly well, like Your Name, although I think the Your Name... That director's latest movie is not really doing that well there. But the last thing I want to say about content is I actually spend a lot more of our time locally on web series, you know, um, content that's being made directly for either Yoku, Tencent, or Aichi. And one of the most interesting series that I see that's been happening the last year is a company called Liu Bai made a, a web series called Longest Day in Chang'an, which is a period, pace, a period piece um, Tang Dynasty, but it took the essence of that Fox TV show 24 with Kiefer Sutherland and put it back in the Tang Dynasty, and it really resonates really well. So I think there's a lot of great, exciting things. My very, very last comment, sorry for being long-winded, Gary, is that to, you know, to really be focused on partnerships in China, it's 
China industry getting through its issues today, which I do believe we're almost through. And I think as, as that kind of rises out, as the trade war kind of melts away, I think there'll be a lot of exciting partnerships in a much more elevated way. Um, well, the first, for, first of all, um, a friend of my producer who produced uh, uh, the Chinatown Detective, oh, yeah. yeah, number three, uh, they shot in New York entirely. And I met him in the Shanghai Film Festival. I said, what are you doing now? He goes, oh, I'm producing a play now. And all the American co-production with China is all in, on hold. So he's not doing anything, and he was very pissed off. And so now he's, yeah, he's producing stage play. Um, anyway, but... Um, Macbeth. But, <laughs> no, <laughs> some, but, but, but it's some foreign play they converted into Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, situation. <clears throat> but, but I thought of there's another way to do Copro, which is uh, we did it uh, in a way. I, I was totally involved. It's like you make, you submit it as a Chinese local film, and then you shoot it somewhere in America. It doesn't matter where. And then you go, okay, here's a movie. You submit it later, and they will say, oh, you got so many foreigners here. It should be a co-production. Then you can convert it later to co-production. <laughs> There's a rule so you can uh, reapply uh, to the government and say, okay, because we got more foreign uh, from, for example, from Germany, that's the sci-fi I produced. <clears throat> and they say, okay, um, you need a one, two, three, four documents then it will convert it to co-production. Um, but of course, it make it a lot more complicated in local film, but there's a way to do it. Um, so uh, I think that may be one way to do it. <laughs> uh, they don't care where the money come from. They really don't care. So if you have uh, uh, American money or somewhere else money, you can, connect with a Chinese uh, uh, production company and say, hey, okay, we'll, let's make a movie together, but as a local film first. And then you, you know, wherever you shoot, they don't care. Uh, where the money come from, they don't care. Then you get approval to shoot it, and then you submit it for approval for the distribution. At that time, it may you can go for co-production. That's what I okay. experienced. Laura, any uh, comments? I'm sorry, we're running out of time, but <laughs> okay. A uh, couple small points uh, on the co-production. One thing they just have a new president of, uh, for this co-production company. His name is Mr. Liu Liu Chun. Good thing is uh, he has been travel back forth from China to the U.S. on behalf of a Chinese, you know, government. So he basically, he has a first-hand knowledge on U.S. film studios, and he is a fluent English speaker, which is, you know, easier to communicate. So he's just new in his role, maybe two, three months. That's one thing. Uh, on the point of a Qingdao movie Metropolis, uh, Larry was mentioning, uh, there are two points I want to add. One is that they, uh, Gary, they did give the 40% incentive back. They yeah. did. <laughs> we, we did get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they started giving that 20% uh, from government, 20% from the studio. Um, on the workers, below the line workers training, they also uh, started to have a new program with the Beijing Film Academy, Qingdao campus. They call it uh, Beichuang. Uh, BFA Modern um, Art Academy, uh, Beijing Film Academy, Qingdao campus. So that's a thing, it's a starting and hopefully it will uh, train more below the line workers. 
camera operators, gaffers, so forth. Yeah, so I, it takes yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, I think I think you're right, uh, Laura. If, if there's one thing I learned about China is that uh, they'll eventually get there, maybe not on your timetable. <laughs> so, so I think that yeah. that's uh, how things work in China. Uh, yeah. So I, I want to thank everybody, uh, but I think that we should uh, open this to uh, some Q and A. Um, I produced a bit in China. I did a historical documentary series on Maritime Silk Road three years ago, well, two and a half years ago, uh, with uh, Guangdong TV. And then um, last year, it was released in January here, I'm not sure when it was released in China, uh, a series called uh, China's Big Bay on the technological developments. And both of those were six episodes long, and they aired here nationally on PBS, and they aired in China. Um, on Guangdong TV, the Maritime Silk Road, and then it was released to CC, uh, CCTV, um, at least on their web, as far as I know. Um, but at any rate, those have been quite successful, and now I'm kind of working on a couple of different projects. One, uh, my primary uh, job is I have a travel series called Weekend Explore that's aired for 16 years on PBS and in a dozen foreign countries. Um, I have just shot my first uh, Mandarin. I hired the girl that was the on-camera an interpreter to be the lead host on that, and then I become the traveling partner. Um, and we're now talking to Tencent on that. They already want to distribute it, and we're waiting to hear back to just a minute. But, um, just with, and, and another company that we work with on the Maritime Silk Road, they are going after money to do a whole series on national parks in China, because that's what I kind of specialize in. Um, with that knowledge, are there landlines I should be looking for? Am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? What, any suggestions? <laughs> Don't you have something? <laughs> no, I mean, well, I mean, without knowing the particulars of it, uh, I mean, there are other travel series similar in China that are on right. that are on the air. So, uh, so you got competition, um, and dealing with ten cent is always interesting. Um, you know, make sure the money gets to your bank account before you <laughs> you actually need it. Um, we've done a lot of stuff with ten cent, and you know, we've had that delay in money. Um, which, of course, the machine is just so big now. Uh, they eventually pay, but, you know, cash flow issues are a nightmare when dealing with, with those guys. Um, but, you know, China's now, it's the number one outbound tourism country in the world. I think this year the numbers are about 110 million people will travel outside of China and probably close to half a billion will travel inside of China. So the market is huge, the, the appetite but travel-related programming is huge, so if done properly, no reason it can't work. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fantastic what you're doing. So I wanted to say you know thank you for sharing that. From a financing point of view, because where I come at it, you know, Larry, obviously from the, from the producing side, um, especially for movies, it's hard to you know bank distribution contracts from China because. You never know if you have the ability to be released or if you have the ability to air. Things can happen that disrupt that final payment, let's say. So it becomes kind of difficult. So when we do the financing in China, we're working with local Chinese companies and we attach ourselves to their balance sheet. And that's what gives us the protection because obviously you don't really have the completion bond thing. And if somebody was really going to do that, that would be kind of, I mean, even though they're trying, you know, when you can't really guarantee delivery, it's kind of a, a, a tough notion. Um, you know, the, the probably like the, the money for those shows probably aren't as big, let's say, as the web series that I described. But I think it's just phenomenal what you're doing. I just want to wish you the best of success. And last qu question for you. Have you read Peter Frankopan's book on the Silk Road, by any chance? Um, you know what? Uh, about I'm about a third of the way through it. That's a big one, as you know. Yeah. And, the blue um, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's got some things that I dis uh, dispute. I mean, there's okay. there's things that I when I first pitched it, I pitched it in 2009. We didn't get the permits until our 2016. Um, and some of the things that I pitched initially were very controversial and uh, not really believed. And then. At the time we actually got the permit to film, there was enough archaeology and stuff like that that started to support that, and that continues to this day. Send me a link. I'd love to watch it. Oh, fantastic. A little bit. Gentlemen, over there.
Go ahead. Oh. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> the guy in the football. Uh, yeah. um, so I have a question for Weiner and, and Proposal. So it's kind of tied into the same uh, situation. Uh, what are the legal limitations placed on U.S.-based businesses trying to create a film enterprise in China and trying to retain ownership of that film enterprise? And, um, and I guess from the financing component, does are outside financiers or capital allowed to set up and own film enterprises in China? And if not, is East West Bank the type of venue that we go to to find those financiers? And the reason why I ask this question is because most of the times when US-based entrepreneurs create new tech, I'm in mean the film tech industry, we created an AI blockchain platform to connect all the film markets. Um, China tends to say, this is not allowed in here, they end up making their own version. So to be able to jump the gun and to see the type of um, tech climate that we're in, I'm wondering, is it possible for a U.S. entity to own a film business in China, a tech enterprise in China, and the financing component for it? Good luck with that one. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, Jesse, question. No. Where do we, we begin? Um, I'll just say, so right, you bring up a lot, a lot of issues there. So it's blockchain, it was, you know, China, we have some new blockchain information out of, of China just recently. I don't know if you're familiar with that. We don't, we don't uh, see suddenly, you know, President Xi suddenly, uh, I think last week, where China had been banned all kind of blockchain activity. Now, now we're for it, essentially. Um, and even the, the, the new um, you know, negative list as far as what companies can do, what foreign companies, with their investment in China, what they can do or not do, Blockchain business, at least now, is now off that list suddenly. So there is definitely a, a push for that. Now, how, now what, what foreign companies will be able to do as far as blockchain in China is still yet to be seen. Um, also, just a, as a review here, on that list as well, you say you know, film enterprises. I'm not sure if we're talking about cinema chains, but now I, I noticed just last week, I think the, the list came out, or maybe a little earlier. But now foreign cinema, foreigners can invest and own um, companies that will, that will build cinemas in China. So that, that's no more on the negative list. So you can go ahead and do that. What has not changed, though, is that foreigners just opening up, let's say, a film production company. You, know, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the film production, no, that's still no. But again, there are ways, some way around that, in the sense that you, know, you can have a partner who is Chinese, um, and in that certain sense, kind of you know, run potentially he'll help to run that business, but again, on paper, it's going to be a, a Chinese citizen who runs that film production. Um, so that's just sort of like a, a really basic overview, and there's sort of details, I guess, we can kind of get into further, but um, maybe on the financing side. Do you want well, that? I think the answer is pretty much the same, and Jesse, it was a great job. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Um, you know, theaters are off the list because nobody really wants to own them, right? So it's like, you know, um, financial institutions, by the way, China's like, hey, even, the, even in the war darkest days of the trade war, America, open your banks here because they want to deleverage. Yeah, come on, share the risk. Um, yes, I think for content, which is probably one of the most prohibited, and, you know, TV probably even more so in some respects than, than, than film, um, the smartest person I've met on that subject is a woman named Ellen Eliasoff, who I'm sure all you guys know pretty well, who, who had opened up Warner Brothers for China, and then Warner Brothers got pissed and then left, and so she was set out of a job, and she actually helped run the Shanghai Expo, and then she went to Village Roadshow and set up Village Roadshow in China, which is now part of Perfect World, but long story short, she was always working on, hey, how is a foreigner can I do business? And she makes Chinese content movies, and every one she does is done as a co-production, but she has Chinese partners. So this is a very long-winded way of saying is that if you want to do something in mainland China, get a mainland Chinese partner that you can partner with and learn from the mistakes of, let's say, Netflix, for example, um, you know, the, the initial <laughs> foray of legendary, right, you know, where they were trying to always kind of muscle their way in instead of finding a partner that can be your front, right? So I don't know if that helps or not. Well, does, well, so to add on to that, is that something, um, the last part of the question, is that something that East West Bank also works on in terms of investing? Do you guys only do films or do you guys 
Well, we're not investors. We're, we're a bank. We do debt, which is loans. We make loans. So for us, you know, we're not taking any of your equity, but there has to be collateral that obviously supports that loan and demonstrates the ability to repay it back. So it's just kind of like that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You know, I'm like the evil Mr. Potter. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be George Bailey, you know? <laughs> I think we have a question. Oh, one more question, I guess. What is your opinion about the tide of change for that to come back around? Are you thinking a year from now we'd be in a better place, two years from now? And for those of us kind of setting up our business, looking towards that future, any advice on, on where to be to be a part of that new way? Larry? Sure. Um, uh, you know, the, the trade war, as far as I see it, you know, is, is kind of a lose-lose. I don't think anybody really wins in this. I think everybody needs to find out how to save face and come up with, with some solution. We think that probably that solution will appear by next summer. Uh, but beyond that, just in a practical doing business way, <clears throat> most of the Chinese companies are wary about doing things. Like Korea was a great thing, you know. Uh, that everything from Korea was banned, and I think most of it is still banned and stuff like that. So even after the government's kind of figured this out, you're going to go through at least another year of people just sitting back and saying, hey, wait a second, this could change any minute. Let's not jump in, you know, with both feet quite yet. So we're thinking it's probably a year and a half, two years away before things, for us at least, normalize. I think this, yeah, I, I agree with Larry, but I also think the signs are there that things are starting to move forward now. But again, I think that's mostly for the local companies. And the stronger the local companies become, again, I think the better partners that they will be, you know, for those. Yeah, right? It's kind of the same thing. Can I, can I just yeah. add, we're, I mean, most of our conversation has been about the film market, but as far as you mentioned, web series, other digital mm -hmm. content, is is that still kind of uh, quiet as well, or is that still moving? You know, I think that Westerners misinterpret what the kind of web portal world really is in China, right? You know, you know China is a closed community. It just is. And the biggest mistake Westerners make is saying, you should be like us. And that's the, that's the number one mistake. They're not. And in fact, all, it's like, that's like Donald Trump's argument, sorry, I'm not trying to get political, but you should be like us. <laughs> oh, okay, great. So where's Ukraine? I'll talk to them. You know, can we get Biden, Ukraine? I'll be just <laughs> like you. All right. <laughs> and okay, I can keep going with that, but this is being taped and it's going to get, you know, like that. Um, anyway, I think that like not viewing China for what China is. So one of the problems with, let's say, hey, I'm going to sell my library to Tencent is you know, the, the um, I hate to use the word censorship because I think that's just a, an inappropriate word. You know, just like, you know, rules that we had, I forget, like from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, up until Bud York and Norman Lear on television, right? Um, that it's, there is no rating system and, you know, what's the type of content that should be shown to, to the masses, let's say. And that if you're letting the web companies self-police themselves and they can go buy a library, let's say they go buy the Canal Plus library and then they're like, oh wait, I can't really show this. Okay, I want my money back. Here, you go take your titles back, right? So it's kind of hard to take this Western thought process, stick it into, in, in, into China. So that's why in China my focus is much more about what's happening from local content and it's just much harder, I think, to monetize Western content in China. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's just, it's just harder. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. They're friends. <laughs> See, friends is interesting, right? Because friends um, is such a great translatable show. Um, and the humor, it's like Seinfeld is not because the humor yeah. is so local. 
And not only is it local, it's like one corner, one block, right? You can go down a street and nobody understands that kind of humor. But Friends is something you get everywhere. Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, Talking to Strangers, things you should know about the people you don't know, right? Um, he actually does this thing on Friends where the facial expressions mirror what they're saying. And so that's what makes it really resonate throughout the world because obviously comedies are hard to travel, Friends does a great job in it, and I think it just kind of hit that kind of sweet spot. Uh, Any thought on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I actually did a web series in China called Modern Life, which I was accused of ripping off Friends. Uh, everybody <laughs> said. Um, but, you know, it was a quintessential buddy movie, that kind of thing. I, I actually did it for Bacardi, the liquor company, uh, who wanted to start promoting that bartending is actually a profession. Um, so in the show, one of the kids goes to bartender school, of course, it's the Bacardi thing. And, uh, but in the show, he never makes a drink. But we filmed Jerry, we established him as the expert, and then we filmed him doing a 10-minute tutorial on every mixed drink imaginable. So if you go to the Bacardi website, there's Jerry from Modern Life teaching you how to make whiskey sours and margaritas and stuff like that. Unbelievably successful. And, you know, the, we love web stuff because you can get it on the air, like, really quick. Um, that show we did for Bacardi did had an audience of 54 million people, and our Chinese partners um, apologized for us that it was only 54 million. See, Laura, you should be doing a Larry Namer series, you know, because <laughs> he has more information than all of us combined will ever have. So it's always a pleasure to, to listen to you, Larry. Uh, any final words from our panel? Um, no, I, I think, you know, as I said before, I mean, China certainly has its difficulties uh, in doing business. It's getting better every day, there's no question. It's getting, becoming more mature. And, you know, the time to jump in is not when Rupert Murdoch feels it's safe. The time to jump in is now when there's opportunities for people to come in there. And, you know, the, the other point is, and, and again, I think Bennett touched on it, is as Americans, we got really spoiled during the, the fall of the Soviet Union, where everybody wanted to be American, marry American, come to America, blah, blah, blah. China's not like that. People in China are really happy to be Chinese. They want to learn about us. They want to uh, understand our, our habits and our customs. But they don't need to be us. They're happy to be who they are. That is well said. Well, well said. Thank well you. said. On that note, on that note well, thank you. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. They want their kids to be like Americans. <laughs> 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 That's probably the truth. Right, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, our distinguished panel. Uh,